What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Dr. Joey Munoz Show. On today's episode, I had a wonderful conversation with a good friend of mine, Eric Bustillo. He is my, uh, I, I'll say my brother from another mother. Because <laughs> him, him and I actually connected on Instagram right when I first started doing social media because he's good friends with my postdoc mentor, Dr. Ormsby, who I just published an episode with a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't checked that out, make sure to check that out. Um, he is a fellow at the ISSN, which is the International Society for Sports Nutrition. And that's one of the first sports nutrition conferences that I went to and I connected with him. He's an absolutely amazing coach and an amazing and humble person. He's a registered dietitian. He works with a ton of people. He's been in the fitness and health industry for over 10 years now. He works with tactical population like firefighters, policemen. He's worked with a ton of professional athletes. And he's also helped combat chronic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, etc., through nutrition and exercise. This was a very pleasant conversation, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Before we get into it, if you've been listening to the podcast and you enjoy it, please take a second to rate the podcast on whatever podcasting app you're using, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts leave a review as well, letting me know what you enjoy, what things you'd like to see. Um, if there's any topics you'd love for me to, to cover in the future, I really like hearing from you guys and getting feedback. So if you just take a minute to do that, I'd greatly appreciate it. And it also helps me grow the podcast, which is obviously something I really want to do because I want to be able to reach as many people as possible with my information. Anyways, I'll leave you with that and I hope you enjoy the show. What's up, Eric? How are you doing, man? Thanks for being all, here today. All good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Awesome, bro. Well, me and you connected what? I think it's about three or four years ago now. We met for the first time at ISSN. I had yeah. just started doing some social media stuff back then. Um, so you're probably one of the first people that I connected with on social media. And then I met you at ISSN. For those of you guys that are listening that don't know what ISSN is, it's a big sports nutrition conference that's held annually. I think that year was actually here in Tampa, right? Uh, yeah, uh, technically yeah. St. Pete, yeah. Yeah, we met there. And um, of course, you're a super lovely and nice guy. And you were very welcoming. And you and I kicked it off um, quickly. And I'm happy that we connected because honestly, I guess when you get into this field, it feels like there's a million professionals, but it really is a small tight knit community, right? And you're one of the people who I think really helps connect others, which is something I really admire from you as well, man. But I'd love if you take a couple minutes to introduce yourself and let us know what you do professionally. And I'd love to hear what you've been up to recently. Yeah, for sure. Again, I appreciate you having me on. I always love doing these things. And I mean, I do think that there's, uh, I tend to kind of keep good people around me. You know what I mean? And you're definitely one of those, even though we're not literally like in proximity. Because yeah. although, you know, 305, uh, <laughs> growing up in Miami. Um, yeah. But uh, it, I, I love that you mentioned that it is a pretty small community. Of, of individuals, even though there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. Um, there's some interesting things that I've learned throughout the years and in, in being in this industry. And I've been doing this for well over a decade now. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of like shady stuff that kind of goes on with, with some individuals and whatever else. And that's just, you'll see that in any industry, but then people oftentimes might see that and gravitate towards like the negative side of things like, uh, I don't know, it's like talking bad about other people or whatever it is. And now don't get me wrong, when you have someone like, uh, like I don't know, the liver king or whatever, I think it's important to call out like if they're being disingenuous with certain things. Yeah. To me, being honest about these things and transparent is important. Um, but there's also a lot of good people. And I think it's important for the good people to keep that in mind and continue fighting the good fight because the industry yeah. is, is uh, it's like the Wild West. Um, so... As far as my, my work and my background, um, I am a registered dietitian. I have my master's in applied exercise science and sports nutrition, which interestingly enough, I never thought that I would go back to school and get my master's, but there was something that, that I enjoyed teaching and lecturing yeah. and those things. And in order to be able to do that, if I ever wanted to do it at a university level, although I'm sure if they really wanted to, they could hire me without having a master's or a PhD um because they can kind of make the rules however they want yeah. <laughs> uh, but the usual rule is that you at least have to have a master's to yep. be able to teach and teach undergrad <clears throat> so i was like you know what 
why not? If that ever becomes a possibility, uh, that I teach a class here or there as an adjunct, whatever, then I'd, I'd want to at least have my master's for it. So I ended up getting my master's. When was that? I, got, I finished my master's in 2020, officially. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was a good, like, year and a half program or so. Um, and I'm, I'm also a fellow of the ISSN. Uh, I'm a certified sport nutritionist through the ISSN, and I have been for over 10 years now. And a fellow, for the individuals who might not know, someone who's a fellow of an organization is someone who either has done something that really stands out for the field in some way. So, like, uh, groundbreaking research or some sort of like seminal research in something. Um, it's also someone who uh, dedicates or has dedicated a lot of time to help uh, an organization uh, just kind of lift it up and progress it forward and whatnot. Um, so I was awarded a, a fellow of the ISSN. Gosh, I forgot when it was. It was either last year. I don't remember when it was. It was either last year or in St. Pete. Uh, I really don't remember. Yeah. That's um, awesome though, man. Congratulations. Yeah. I appreciate that. And a, a lot of the stuff that I talk about is nutrition related, being a registered dietitian. But I think sometimes people don't know that I'm also a certified strength coach, personal trainer, and a CrossFit coach as well. So the, the physical activity part is something that's important for me. Um, but those are all like letters after your name and whatever else. As, as a practitioner, I just really enjoy helping people thrive, kind of push themselves. So the coaching is huge for me. Like the way that we talk to people, utilizing something like motivational interviewing or just kind of meeting people where they're at and, and understanding that there's always going to be nuance to these things. Again, because from what I said before, there's just so much stuff out there, so much information, both good and bad. Um, I like to think that I'm like a defender of the good in some way, shape or form, you know? Um, so doing a lot of that. And then my work background is as a dietitian, just coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, doing group lectures and coaching, um, working in the corporate wellness space, working in sports nutrition. So working with athletes from a professional level to a collegiate level to even a much younger, like high school. And I've seen all sorts of, of athletes from NFL football players, WNBA, Major League Baseball, CrossFit, but not like going to the CrossFit games, just, you know, individuals who work out CrossFit on a regular basis. Uh, golfers, tennis players, but then on the medical nutrition therapy side of things, helping people with diabetes, uh, cholesterol issues, blood pressure, cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, gastrointestinal issues. I mean, I've, I've seen so many things throughout the years. And I also try to stay involved in some way, shape or form with research as well. So even though I'm not a researcher and I'm not technically in academia, um, I try to get involved as often as I can with studies and, and I usually try to, to get friends of mine who are in academia to remember that I'm around and I can help them out because being a part of the gym, cause I'm, I'm a registered dietitian and I also coach down here across the coconut grove, um, down here in Miami. And I have a bunch of awesome people in that gym who I'm pretty sure most, if not all of them would be happy to help out in some kind of like research study. Especially if it's about CrossFit. Um, yeah. I definitely think we need more information on CrossFit from a scientific standpoint. Um, and the hardest part of a research study is getting participants. And I'm like, I have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just, that's like a, a very long elevator ride speech as to what, what I kind of do as far as work goes. Um, oh, and I did leave out one, one particular group doing a lot of work with like tactical athlete populations, police, fire, military. Just or in the last couple of months, actually, I've done so much traveling. Some of it was work. Some of it was was just pleasure, if you will, where I went from I'm, and I'm based out of Miami. It's where I was born and raised. I love it down here. She would mom, Colombian dad. And uh, I had workshops. I went up to North Carolina. From there, I went to Vancouver. That was a pleasure, not, not work. Then to visit a friend. Then from Vancouver, had a workshop in Ocala. Came back down to South Florida, had the ISSN conference in mid-June. Two days after that, went for a friend's birthday celebration to Norway and Denmark. I was there for about a week. Got back here on a Monday. That same Wednesday, I went to Colorado to catch a concert at Red Rocks with my brother. We were back here on a Friday. I was here for about a week, week and a half, and left again to 
I don't even know where, probably DC. I ended up in Boston, came back down. I went back to DC again. Uh, I'm probably missing some other. I just kind of been all over the place. It's it's crazy, but uh, I'm super blessed to be able to do it. Dude, I think you've traveled more in the past couple of weeks than I have in my life, man. <laughs> <laughs> it feels it feels like I've traveled maybe too much. If that's even a thing. No, but that's great, man. That's awesome that you're fortunate enough to be able to do those things. You know, you mentioned something that's really interesting that I quickly want to touch on because you mentioned that you're not a researcher, but you like to stay involved in research, right? And yeah, I think traditionally we think of like people involved in research as researchers. And that was my, uh, my, um, what am I, the word I'm trying to look for here is uh, the way I was trained, right? I was trained to be a traditional researcher because I went the PhD route and that's essentially what you're trained to do but you really notice that like in order for science to get out to the general population and for it to be applicable to the general population it doesn't just take researchers doing research right so research have to do has researchers have to do the research but then that research has to be disseminated to the general public and there are people who are on the education side of things that know how to read the research but also know how to convey that message in a simple enough language for people and i think that's where i've transitioned more into now where i'm not actively doing any research but i have the skills to be able to read it, interpret it, and educate people about those things in what I consider an appropriate fashion, right? Where I'm not like making any ridiculous claims or anything like that. And I can actually um, understand and explain what certain studies show, which I think is exactly where you're at as well. I know you mentioned having people participate in studies, but you also help educate people about these topics. And that's also because of your educational background that you're able to do these things, right? So it is important to, to know that like research isn't just doing research. It's like all of these different aspects, man. Um, sure. One thing I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you work with a ton of different people, right? You've been working from people in like tactical populations who are like high performers to people who are struggling with serious chronic diseases, right? What are some of the people that you enjoy working with most and why? Uh, man, the, the answer that first comes to mind when you ask that question is anyone who's actually willing to put in the work. Um, because I've been doing this for a while and some people will come seeking help and those sorts of things, but not everyone is really willing to put in the, the work. I've had professional athletes come see me and we'll do their initial consultation and then they'll just kind of disappear off the face of the earth. And yeah. it's just like, uh, and, and some people might say, uh, well, you know, Hey, at least, at least you got paid for seeing them. And I'm like, that's not what it's all about. Don't get me wrong. Money is important and we should be paid for our services. Um, but that's not what it's about. There's, there's, we have to seek fulfillment in what we do. Certainly. And a part of that fulfillment comes from seeing someone excel in their sport, uh, achieve certain health goals, performance goals. And if they're not willing to kind of show up and now I don't take this personally, I will say anyone who's listening to this, that is a coach, a dietitian or a, a doctor, anything along those lines, we have to not take things personally. If someone doesn't particularly do very well, as far as achieving certain goals, um, I think, yes, there's accountability on our part where we have to kind of recognize what could I have done better or whatever else. But, you know, that saying you could only lead a horse to water and you can't make it drink. There are also many times when you can't even lead the horse to water, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it depends highly on the person. So, you know, I don't have an answer that's like, you know, I, I the tactical population is my favorite population. Um, my, my favorite people to work with are the ones that are willing to to just kind of like ask the questions, stay involved and, and engage, uh, to have a regular conversation with me, whether it's via text message and asking questions or just uh, tracking their, their macronutrients on a regular basis, if that's what they're doing. Because not everyone tracks their macros and that's perfectly fine. Um, but people who can actually stick with it and who just kind of have not just buy-in, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, but are willing to to do more and go above and beyond because they care about themselves. So I'm like, you show me that you care. And, and I love that, you know? Uh, yeah, that was uh, the first thing that came to mind. No, I think that's a great answer. And honestly, that's not the type of answer that I was thinking of, but that's a fantastic answer. You know, I was thinking about myself with the clients that I work with in the back, in the background while you were speaking there. It's like, it, it's tough. I think it's really tough to say why some people are so ready for change and ready to put in the work and while others are not, even though they like, 
express wanting to make change, right? And actually even invest financially, which I think is a big commitment because let's face it, like investing in a service to hire somebody else to help you with your nutrition, to help you, whether it's lose weight or learn more, or improve your body composition or your health, like it's usually not a, a cheap service. And for some people, it can be quite like, a, it can it can sting, right? Financially. And yet even then they don't follow through. And I always think like, I wonder why that is. Um, million dollar exactly. question, right? But <laughs> I work with a ton of different people too, usually all around the body composition, uh, body composition goals. But I have younger people, older people, uh, men, women, people that have no experience with lifting, people who are experienced, people who want to lose weight, people who want to build muscle and gain weight. And across the board, I always definitely just enjoy the people that are willing to put in the work and they're excited, right? Because that mm. makes our job fun too. When you check in with them, you have a call with them. They're super stoked about the progress they're making. They're happy that they hired you. It's an awesome relationship. That always feels really, really good, right? Well, without uh, a doubt. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, man, with the people that you've worked with, and obviously you've been doing this for way longer than I have. So you have a ton more of like real life experience than I do. What do you see are some of the main struggles that people experience when trying to achieve their goals, whether it's body composition, performance, et cetera? Uh, a big part of it is drowning out outside noise. Um, because for them, a lot of people will give them input on, oh, you're doing this wrong or whatever else. And it's like, they may be sharing with them like, hey, I'm working with someone who's helping me with X, Y, or Z things. Uh, and then, you know, it's like, oh, he said it's okay for you to have cereal. No, 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 no. You, you can't do that. And that could be a friend, uh, uh, a fitness person. Like maybe yeah. they see a personal trainer or they, they do like, I don't know, group fitness classes. And they're kind of sharing that with like the, the instructor or the coach. Um, so that's one thing kind of drowning out the outside noise yeah. because it can be – if you say anything with conviction, there's a, a good possibility that a good number of people are going to believe it, especially yeah. people who don't know any better, right? Yeah. So essentially, uh, step one is trusting the process and, trust and process. putting trust in the person you're working with. Without a doubt, for sure. That's definitely it. And it's funny that you say that because I have this like three line thing that I tell people. I say, trust the process, be patient and stay consistent. And I've been saying this for years. And it's like, it's a simple recipe, but it's not easy to execute on for yeah. what I just mentioned. You have a million voices in your ear. Um, so that's definitely one thing. Um, another thing that can be difficult is helping people, basically helping people be patient, right? Because we want things to happen as fast as possible. So it's almost like coaching people to just kind of understand like, hey, this is not going to be an overnight thing. And we might not see results right away, whatever those results might be, weight gain, fat loss, muscle gain. So just kind of coaching them through the process of, of being patient with like, hey, this is going to take time. You might not lose weight in those first three weeks. In fact, the scale might go up a little bit because of whatever reason. Maybe I'm trying to get someone to just eat enough throughout the day and maybe they were starving themselves and then having binges at night or whatever else. And like, but yeah. I only eat X number of calories. Um, so helping them kind of understand that these fluctuations are, are very normal and helping to keep them engaged with that because people can also lose focus and kind of lose the, the excitement of what they're Certainly. doing because we base everything off of results. Yeah. Number results. Yeah. So that's why I try to tell people too, like, we got to understand, I kind of channel them to focus on what's the most important thing for you. Is it going to be weight loss? Um, is it going to be uh, managing your, your symptoms of IBS, let's just say? Um, what's the most important thing? Because if those IBS symptoms are really high up there on that list, I'm not going to worry so much about you losing weight. Eventually, we can get to that, right? So say compartmentalizing that. But it can still be frustrating if the scale doesn't go down. Right. Yeah. So again, coaching someone is helping them recognize like, look, we got to be patient through this for sure. Um, because once people lose that engagement, it's hard for them to, to get it back. And that's where I think individuals like you and I can have a hard time sometimes because there are programs out there where people are going to lose five pounds in one week because they're yeah. so restrictive. Right. Yeah. 
And maybe that's not particularly our approach. Maybe there are patients or clients that we'll work with that yeah. would benefit from something like that because everything is situational to the individual. Yeah. But generally speaking, I think we're we're on that same page of like this got has got to be sustainable. It's a lifestyle approach, and that's going to be slower. Instant gratification is this human thing that we just want. That you want to win the lottery, you don't want to put in that blood, sweat, and tears. And I mean, some people will, but they'd rather win the lotto. Um, yeah. So it's it's those are a couple of things that that can make it pretty difficult sometimes in in working with people. And of course, um, everyone is different. Not everyone kind of functions the same. But we have these models of like psychology, like the trans theoretical model of change. Yeah. And trying to meet someone where they're at. Uh, are they in a contemplation phase? Are they already taking action and, and those sorts of things? So it, it can be pretty complicated in working with people that that keeps it kind of interesting too, you know? Yeah, I think the the what you mentioned about being patient encompasses so much, right? Because it encompasses one, the idea of realistic expectations with people may or may not even know what a realistic goal is in a realistic time frame, which is why I try to educate my clients on what smart goals are, right? Um, and how to set those and how to really start thinking through those things. I mean, dude, I can't tell you how many times like I've started working with a client. I'm like, okay, we're going to set goals and I want you to use this smart goal framework. And they're like, wow, this is really hard because I haven't even thought about it with this level of detail, right? Like the the goal is just, I want to lose weight, but it's not, I want to lose X amount of pounds, which is specific, Right discuss why is that important to you in the first place? Because oftentimes people don't even think about why the goal is important to them. And three, having a realistic time frame, and then four, discussing what are the things that you're going to do to get there. That's how you really set a goal, right? Um, that means something and that it's actually achievable because you set a plan ahead of time. So that's one aspect of it in terms of having realistic expectations. I think another aspect of patience, which kind of goes hand in hand with patience, it's not the same thing, but it's this idea of like not having an all or not a nothing mindset where like, if you see no progress, that's it. You're done. Um, that's hard that's for not, some people. It is hard, man. And, and like you were saying with one of the things I say up front with anybody that I'm going to work with is like, Hey, I am not in this for like a, a, a quick, a quick, like uh fix essentially, because that's not what this is. My coaching is very like, yes, it's nutrition and training, but it's very like lifestyle focused too. I'm going to give you small habits. I want you to focus on because my whole thing is like, your lifestyle is going to determine your health and the way your body looks like those two things go hand in hand. And in many ways, if you improve your, your, your body composition, you're going to be improving your health too. So it's kind of like a nice, uh, what is it knocking out two birds with one stone, right? Because everybody wants to look better, but people also want to improve their health. Those things obviously go hand in hand, but my whole thing from the beginning, it's like, Hey, we're going to be patient here. This is a long-term game. And one of the things that I really like to talk to my clients about, because like you mentioned, people want to see a big win at first. And those big wins are usually tied to things that you can measure objectively, like a number, like seeing the scale weight go down. But I talk about subjective wins too, right? Like this idea that like you actually have a structured plan now. You've been following a plan. You haven't been following a plan before. I like to gamify things too. I give my clients specific habits, like start off your day with a breakfast that has 40 grams of protein, random habit there. But, you know, they'll just like tick it off, like yes or no. So that adds like a small win that is like, objectifying something that's relatively subjective, right? And those things give small wins. And I've found that to be very helpful because clients will be like, well, the scale weight hasn't gone down, but I hit my habits for the week and I did it and I did my workouts. That's a win. So it's like other ways of giving them a win that isn't so focused on the scale, man. Do you use any of those things? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll, uh, and it's not with everyone. Um, it really depends on, on the person. Some yeah. people love having that to-do list, right? Yeah. Um, so they love checking something off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it's not it's not every time. But I will give people like certain things to think about, uh, whether they check it off a list or not. But even if it just gets their brain going, I mean, if we think yes. about it, how much can we really change someone? I don't think we can change anyone at all. What I do think that we can do is we can make people think. Yes. Right? If at most, or at least, we get somebody to think about something, then cool. Now they're going in the right direction because we start thinking about that. So giving them specific things like that to measure, sometimes we, we will definitely do it. It could be hitting your protein goal. Yeah. It could be going for a walk and, and, and not even measuring your steps, but just, hey, go for, I call it a digestion walk. Just go for a digestion walk. After you ate your dinner, go for 
a 10 minute walk, five minutes yeah. out, five minutes back, assuming you live somewhere that you feel safe and comfortable. Yeah. Those sorts of things. Um, I will say though, one thing that I've, I've paid a lot of attention to is my language around things. So instead yeah. of, instead of calling maybe everything a particular goal, um, I'll call like if someone wants to lose weight an X amount of weight, I refer to it as a desired outcome. And then what I do for the goal, I make the goal the, hey, let's hit your protein. Hey, let's mm. hit, hit the gym five days this week. I like that. So, you know what I'm saying? I make the goals like the more immediate, more actionable things. And then thinking about my desired outcome is to eventually get to whatever it is. Mm. Because I feel I like language that. matters, man. Language really matters. So yeah. and, and sometimes even to a fault, if I hear someone say, oh, yeah, I'm diabetic. I'm like, well, wait, you have diabetes. You're not diabetic. There's a difference in psychologically in how we frame these things, you know? So having somebody think about it as a desired outcome, I think helps them, whether they realize it or not, helps them see like, okay, this is what I'm looking for uh, at the end and then continued because it's not just, I want to lose 10 pounds. No, it's one, I want to keep those 10 pounds off, but then continue doing what I've been working on, getting enough protein, getting enough plant foods, getting my physical activity, my sleep, my walks, my reading and, and those sorts of things. So changing our language definitely matters and sometimes that's where i get a little like uh, like frustrated when i hear certain things being said or like in a certain way because mm -hmm. language what we say matters and how we say it matters yeah who who we're saying it to so i kind of went off track of like the objective things but that just kind of came to mind uh, in the conversation yeah. now no dude i'm so happy that you brought that up like if there's one thing that i know you for being is very compassionate and like you really think about the things you say and how they affect others. Like that was something I picked up from you like the first time I met you. Um, and I'm sure that's something that obviously translates very well to you working with your clients or with whatever populations you're working with. And it, it there's a difference between the, the language and the conversations that the coach has with the clients. And let's not even client, say call it client, like with a person, right? Who's trying to achieve a certain body composition goal or desired outcome, as you mentioned. And then there's also the internal conversation. Right. What are some of the things that like people often tell themselves or identify as that are really uh, detrimental towards them achieving whatever it is they want to achieve? And, and why is it so harmful? So uh, one of the, the big things there is that they see themselves only as who they once were or yeah. even who they currently are. Right. So and, and, and they'll identify with like their, their body type, for example. Yes. Speaking specifically about body composition individuals, and this is a big one because that, that the weight loss industry is a huge industry from supplements to programs to financially and, and all of that. The self-image component is huge. So when, when yes. people aren't able to see themselves as someone else, right, you almost have to not forget the person that you once were, but acknowledge the fact that you're not that person anymore. Yeah. Right. So that's a big part of it where the self-image, if they continue to see themselves as uh, I've heard, I've had people call themselves like, oh man, like, I'm just a fat slob, you know? And if they continue to use that type of language with themselves, yeah. and a lot of times I, I, I try to correct it. Um, and again, doing it in a way that isn't like making them feel bad about it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I like to make people think, you know, I want yes, them to yes, think yes, about, yes. oh, what's, what's, what's this language that, uh, that I'm using with myself? So that's a big one that it's like these, these self-limiting beliefs and self-limiting yes, behavior, yes. you know? So they think that they can't be something else, even though they're, they're working on, on being healthier and they're working on, maybe it is losing body fat, right? There's nothing wrong with wanting to lose body fat. There's nothing wrong with wanting to gain muscle. I think these are conversations that we should be able to have. Yeah. Of course, some people might get outraged by certain words that are used. Like yeah. if you do use excess body fat, is someone going to get upset at it? And it's like, we have to be able to look at things objectively. Yeah. I'm just saying something for what it is. If I call yeah. someone, uh, maybe they're underweight or they have very little body fat or if they have excess yeah. body fat, it's just being objective about it. Yeah. Yeah. So being able to tell people that in a, in a, I think in a compassionate way is important and then help them have compassion for themselves. Because if you're going to continue calling yourself, let's say, a fat slob, you're not doing yourself uh, any good like services here, right? Yeah, you're essentially being mean and rude to yourself. 
Exactly. For sure. So there's that, that way of thinking where if someone is going through something personally, I think it's cool for people to ask themselves, like, what advice would I give a friend of mine? Like, what would I say yeah. to my friend right now? And then am I talking to myself in that way? You know, yeah. because other There's, challenges too is like, is even upbringing, you know, we're, we're trying to reprogram things for people yeah. where, you know, you have to eat everything on your plate before you can even have dessert, those sorts of things. And that's just one little example specifically related to food, because growing yeah. up, people were shamed and guilted into eating things or looking a certain way, especially like in the Hispanic culture, like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, if, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. if you're a little chunky, you're strong. You're a strong yeah, yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. So then now from there, are we telling people that they that they should be a little bit chunky? Or if we're telling them, hey, you need to lose a little weight. Are we telling them they, they need to be skinny? So there's a lot of stuff that goes on up here that I think people might, oftentimes might not even think about. Um, so getting down to the root of that is super important because that is going to help change their views on on and of themselves like when i hear someone tell me like i i've worked with people who have been on a diet since they were maybe 10 years old and now they're 45 or 65 anywhere in between there and to hear them say like wow this is the first time that i actually feel good about myself and the food choices that i'm making and i actually feel good physically i'm just like man like i wish this information or like uh, uh, a Joey or an Eric existed in the 1960s or something like that. Yeah, yeah. For, because now you've been went an entire life, yeah, like having afraid, being afraid of eating like carbohydrates. And I'm just like, God, this is wild, you know? Yeah. Are you tired of spending countless hours grocery shopping, cooking, and preparing your meals? I get it. Time is precious, and that's where Icon Meals comes into play. I've partnered with Icon Meals to bring you delicious, macro-friendly, and high-protein meals that will make it easier than ever for you to achieve your fitness goals. I understand that you may have hesitations over the cost of a meal prep service compared to cooking food at home. But let's face it, how often do you spend more money eating out because you didn't have time to prepare your food at home anyways? With Icon Meals, you not only save time, but you invest in your health. These meals are carefully crafted to be healthier and more in line with your fitness goals than most of the food that you eat out anyways. So why wait? Visit iconmeals.com and explore their wide array of mouth-watering meals. And as a special bonus for listening to this podcast, use code JOSEPH10 at checkout for a special discount off of your order. By the way, you can find all of the necessary links in the description of this podcast. Don't let time be a barrier to your success. Choose Icon Meals and fuel your journey towards a healthier, fitter you. Yeah, man, I, you know, the. so when I talk to my clients, I'm very big on the language they use too. And I've oftentimes said things like, no, 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 even though it means the same thing, don't say it like this, you should probably say it like this. And it's because even if we say it like in a joking manner, the things we say, or think about ourselves definitely impact the way we feel and the decisions that we make too, right? And I think, listen, it's really hard to uh, believe that you can be a certain person if you haven't had any proof that you can be a certain person yet, right? So I do think first and foremost, it starts with believing that you can achieve that rather than just identifying as blank, right? Because the first thing you have to do is believe in yourself. And that can be tough in, in and of itself, right? Like sure. believing that, for example, if you are overweight or if you are out of shape or you want to achieve a certain physique or have a certain lifestyle, first is believing that you can do that, right? And now some people, for some reason, can almost coach themselves to do that and don't need to work with a coach and can get there on their own. And some people need to work with somebody else. Um, and then I think our role as a coach is really helping demonstrate or show to that person that they are capable of achieving what they want to achieve right and some of the the coolest things that i've achieved with some of my clients are big changes in psychology man which again are subjective wins they're not objective wins right but for example i can think of so many examples right now but like i started working with a client and she is by no means overweight and the word that she was using she's saying i'm fat right just 
throwing that out there. And she's very like uh, rough around the edges. So she uses language like that. And, you know, we started working two weeks together. And I think she had some concerts that she was going to with family and friends and stuff, but and some birthday parties, but she had just started this program with me. And so two weeks in, I think her weight was just like slightly up. And like, we were talking about fluctuations and weight are normal. And she was like, oh, I need to get my shit together. I'm fat. And I was like, listen, you can't be using that language. I, I told them like, I'm not trying to moderate what you say and what you don't say. I just want you to think about the words you use because they impact the way you think, right? And so then when you start to make decisions from day to day, even if you're just joking around, you have those words in the back of your head and not they're not helpful in any way. And thankfully, she was able to acknowledge that. And she's like, no, you're right. I shouldn't be using those words. At the end of the day, I am relatively healthy. And I was like, listen, you haven't done anything wrong. Yes, we started this program together, but you had all of these events scheduled. You had concerts to go to. You had uh, you know, your grandkids birthday party. And these are events to be celebrated and to be enjoyed. Right. And that goes back to the all or nothing mentality. And it's like, you have to learn how to be flexible psychologically as well. And know when it's okay to step, take a step back because your weight is not going to stay stable always. Right. There are periods of times where it's normal for your weight to go up, like around the holidays, birthday parties, events, et cetera. And it really comes down to the balance of like how many of those things you do and how many you don't. Um, and I'm going into a different topic here altogether. But those okay. psychological wins are huge too, man. I've had this experience multiple times because I think one of the things that people struggle with a ton is when they're trying to lose weight, improve their health, et cetera. And they've been on point, let's say three or four weeks, and then a vacation comes up or a family event comes up. They get really nervous about those things, right? Because like, man, every time those things come around, like I can't help myself. I just eat a ton because I'm a fat person, right? I have no self-control. Uh, this is just what I do. That's what they identify as currently, right? And so we have these conversations before the event. I'm like, hey, listen, you've been doing absolutely amazing over the past month. Uh, you don't have to be perfect 24-7 always. You just have to stay consistent. And these events, you should actually give yourself permission to just enjoy yourself, not worry so much about your nutrition. You can still execute on some general rules like having uh, a meal that's satisfying and trying not to snack making sure you have protein on your plate, you know, general healthy eating. But besides that, give yourself a lot of flexibility to just enjoy the events. And I'm actually thinking of a specific situation here with a client of mine that I'm working with currently, who's down about 25 pounds, but he was well in the 300s, right? And he had his brother's wedding. He was really nervous about this. And we had this conversation. I'm like, dude, it's just your brother's wedding. Just enjoy it. Eat whatever you want. Have some drinks. Have fun. This happens once in a lifetime, hopefully, right? Um, and so he went, had fun. And then when we talked after, he was like, man, this is the first time in my life I've been able to enjoy an event like that and not stress about food. And he told me on top of that, he was like, the fact that I gave myself permission, like I didn't feel like I had to eat everything. Like I just ate my meal and I felt good and I just enjoyed the, the evening with everybody. And he was thanking me for that. And I was thanking him for being open-minded and willing to try these things, right? So those small psychological wins are so big, man. It feels so good. When a client's like, man, I enjoyed this event and didn't stress about it. I went on vacation. My weight is a little bit up, but it's not that big of a deal because you told me that it's to be expected. Your weight's supposed to be up after vacation. And I think those are the little hurdles that people experience. And then when they have an all or nothing mentality on top of that, they're like, man, I just did bad. Now I'm just going to continue doing bad. Forget all this, right? And it's like, no, 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 no. Give yourself permission to have fun when it's time to have fun. And then understand when it's time to get back to work, it's time to get back to work, right? Think of it the same as your career. Like on vacation, you're not working. You get back home. Now it's time to get back to work. It's the same sort of mindset. But uh, that's always really rewarding for myself as a coach when I hear my clients say those things. For sure. I agree. Those, those, are, those are the victories that are non-scale victories, right? Yes. They're, they have nothing to do with your body composition. It's just like you feel good. And hey, if you feel good, in turn, that's going to help you perform much better with other goals and things that you might have. Um, and especially with those all or nothing people, the all or nothing mindset and mentality, those individuals can be very difficult to work with because, and especially like as a coach, you want to meet people where they're at. Yeah. With the all or nothing mentality, it's, it's difficult because you want to meet them where they're at, but you know that the all or nothing, there has to be a shift in that. There has to be some kind yeah. of a change. Because life isn't just black or white. Now, I understand if it's a, a, a professional athlete, like I get it. I've worked with NFL football players. They had to be at a certain weight by a certain time yeah, yeah. because, I don't know, several million dollars, their yeah, yeah, yeah. work, right? 
Um, but generally speaking, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and it's tough. So when you get those, those, hey, I, I got to enjoy the wedding and I didn't feel bad about it at all because you, you, you showed me, like you showed me the way, you know? We're basically Jedi Masters or whatever they're called. The Obi-Wan yeah, Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one thing you just mentioned. You said that those are like non, non-scale non weight victories, and they certainly are. And you mentioned that they don't necessarily contribute to body weight directly, but I think indirectly they do long-term. Right? Yeah. Because indirectly, that's what helps you live a healthy lifestyle long-term. And I'd say most people who really struggle with their weight and their health, at least one aspect of it is that all or nothing mentality. Right. Because most people who seek out a coach, especially for health and body composition, have probably been trying to lose weight for years. Right. Because the first thing somebody does is not hire a coach. The first thing somebody does is like follow this weight loss diet, like easiest place of entry. Right. Like hiring a coach is not uh, the easiest place of entry into trying to lose weight. So most of these people have been trying to do these things for years and just failed because they never talked about these particular topics. And although it's, it is hard to work with somebody who has that type of mentality, at least from my experience, the majority of the people that I've worked with think that way when we first start working together. And I don't have any sort of like secret formula or recipe to change their mindset. It really just comes down to having conversations and exposing them to these situations over time. You know, like the first time it happens, it might be a little bit stress. Then they see it's not that big of a deal. Then we talk about it again. Then another situation comes up. And that's why like coaching is irreplaceable. Because sometimes I've I've really thought about like, man, how could I put the things that I work with my client or like get get all give somebody the value of one-on-one coaching without it being one-on-one coaching, like a course or something like that. I'm like, it you really can't, right? Because it's that personal relationship and them trusting you and you guiding them that yeah, you could talk, you know, and people are gonna be listening to this, Eric, and I'm sure they'll they'll find some valuable stuff they'll take away but it's the conversation piece that you can't get right and that conversation piece i think is really really valuable without a doubt the the educational component is is so important so of course i think is great um but i've been having this conversation with with several people as of late over the last several months and it's will ai ever replace coaches no and I agree with you. I don't see it happening. I think AI can be a helpful tool for sure. Uh, for those who might not know, AI is artificial intelligence. The robots are taking over, right? We're turning into Terminator. Um, if you if you heard that and don't know what AI is, just where where have you been living the past year? <laughs> yeah, it's cr- I mean, you never know, right? We never know. But yeah, AI is just, it's everywhere now. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think we're ever going to replace it. You know, I don't think we're ever going to replace the human aspects uh, with something like artificial intelligence, it can be helpful for sure, without a doubt. And don't get me wrong. I have my, my doubts and concerns about AI for sure, but it can be helpful, but there's nothing like, like you said, the conversational piece, being able to understand where someone is at a certain point in their life, you know, hearing, seeing, reading the emotional aspect yeah. of it from the tone in their voice to the look in their eyes, to just the yeah, expressions yeah, yeah. that their face makes. Um, there's nothing that is like that. And that's where coaching is absolutely invaluable. But of course, there has to be that that trust from the person as well. Right. It's a two-way street. So we have to kind of be confident in, in each other. Like, hey, this yeah. is a partnership. It's not me telling you what to do. This is me. You're the one driving the car. I'm like the GPS. We're working together to get to this thing, you know? Certainly, man. And um, yeah, so I've thought about this a lot too, right? And I think at least where we are currently and even in the near future, like it seems like this whole AI stuff is really good at information-based stuff. So like, could it replace making a course? Sure. It could probably make a course 10 times better than you can in like a fraction of the speed, right? But, and and this is funny because when I first started working with clients, I was like, I have a lot of information. I'm going to be good at this because I can give you all of this really good information. And that's like just a fraction of it, right? I'm sure you probably have met, I, and I know people that like aren't necessarily the brightest when it comes to like knowing the intricacies of nutrition and exercise science okay. and, physio- and physiology, but they're great coaches because it's that human connection aspect, aspect right? Like, I don't think a machine will be able to replace that in terms of like 
connecting to the same degree because part of it, like you mentioned, is very much trust and the bond you have with that person. That takes time, right? And can it get to the point where we're going completely off topic here, but where a person can have that sort of connection with a machine, like maybe, but I don't think anywhere in the near future, like definitely not anywhere in the near future, you know? Um, Because again, like it just doesn't seem like there is so much to connecting with somebody that behind, behind just like the words you're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely. Especially like, like sometimes people, hire certain people because they have like a similar background to them. And that's a, a, a point of connection, right? Relatability, like you can't relate to a machine. Um, being able to pick up on, on nonverbal cues, like you mentioned, right? Being able to talk about like specific situations and knowing like having previous history as, as a reference point, right? Like if a client comes up to a machine and says like, oh, I'm struggling with uh, the way or, or I'm going to be stressed about, for example, we were talking about going to a wedding, right? Like if I've been working with this client for months, I know the things he's done before. I know how he's felt about it before. I know conversations we've had. I can relate to those things. All of those things add to the trust. Um, and I, I definitely don't think a machine can replace that at all. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't think so. I, uh, and again, I really think that they can be helpful. I think that AI can, can help with so much. And especially if we know and learn how to use it to our advantage, but like, like you said, the relatability, the relatability aspect to it is, is huge. Some I've had, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. But I had a patient one time who is an, an older Jewish man. And he was kind of like complaining to me in a way or letting out his frustration. I don't want to say complaining, but he was like in a hospital and that, you know, some like a, a, a Hispanic doctor came in to see him. And it was like, I just want a good Jewish doctor to come and see me. And I was like, I was like, here we go, say anything, right? Like, yeah, respect yeah. this person's opinion and just like, let that be. But even that, that's a, 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 a maybe a terrible example yeah. of how people want some sort of relatability, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I use one specifically with myself. There was someone who ultimately ended up not working with me because I'm not vegan. Okay. I mean, cool. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it is what it is. If you think that I can't help you because I don't subscribe to your yeah. diet tribe, so to speak, yeah. um, then, then by all means, but for practitioners, for dietitians, for coaches, one thing I like to say is, is try not to be neutral religious, right? Yeah. And nothing against any form of religion or anything, but some people can be quite dogmatic with their religion. We shouldn't be that way with our style of, of coaching. But you have those people that are only going to, Oh, I'm I'm the keto coach, right? I'm the vegan coach. I'm the carnivore, whatever. That's how you know they're uh, probably not a good coach. That's how you know they're probably not a good coach. They can maybe help someone lose weight. Yeah. But yeah. if I take away everything that you're eating and only give you steak, then I, I would yeah. think you're probably going to lose weight. But how long are they going to do that for? Either way, you know, there's something about the human aspect of it all, and yeah. I I think that the technology will get to a point where computers can read facial expressions and those things like you're talking into a camera and in that camera there's a computer screen and monitor and it talks to you like if it's a coach but it's actually uh this artificial intelligence like google machine or whatever um i think that we're, we're we can get there but like that machine won't be able to like relate with you and say like man like remember that time when we met at isn yeah, yeah, st yeah. pete you know, there's like something along those lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's, it's, I find it hard to wrap my head around. I think anything yeah. is possible, but the human aspect of everything is, is so important. Or connect for because we have a similar background. You know, I'm, I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you and I clicked immediately too. It's like, oh, you're Cuban. I'm Cuban. That was one of the first things we had conversations about immediate connection, right? Like you definitely won't be able to do that with a machine. My whole thought process is like from an emotional standpoint and all this stuff, like essentially we're trying to get machines to get to where humans are, where humans are already there. And it's, I think, going to get exponentially and exponentially closer, but never really hit the same degree of that. Um, yeah. Anyways, enough about machines. I wanted to <laughs> ask you uh, one more thing, because I know you're huge in the CrossFit community. I've never done CrossFit personally. I came from the background of like thinking like, oh, CrossFit sucks, because I just used to see all the injury videos and all of this. And then the more I learned, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Some CrossFit coaches suck. And unfortunately, those things get highlighted, right? And now I'm of the mindset, and I've never really done CrossFit personally, but 
one, I love the community aspect of it. I think that's so helpful for a lot of people. And two, I don't think there's any other modality of exercise where you get that much like bang for your buck in like 30 or 45 minutes. Now, the downside is that it's extremely hard, but you're doing strength training, you're doing mobility work, you're doing cardiovascular work, explosive work. Could you talk a little bit about CrossFit, why you're so passionate about it? And what are some of the benefits for like, you know, if somebody is trying to start training, I usually start with very like simple strength training stuff, but maybe why should somebody consider CrossFit in the first place? For sure. Yeah. No, I appreciate that question. I am. Um, and just for the record, I, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm like, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I use the term CrossFit evangelist. Dude, um, I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I like to use that term because it kind of paints a picture because I don't think that CrossFit is the only way, right? Yeah. If someone is a CrossFit evangelist and they're going to be like, you know, your bodybuilding split sucks. Yeah. Like you go to Orange Theory, that's horrible. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. What do you mean you're 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 only walking? Like, and it's just like no, like all of these things can can work. Um, the the CrossFit, like if someone asks what is CrossFit, the definition is going to be um, constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity. Um, and I think that's a very good and brief summary of it, <clears throat> because we know very well. That intensity matters uh, yeah. if we're looking to achieve certain goals and even for health parameters that we might be trying to reach or achieve. Um, we know that intensity is going to be an important factor. And you get that with CrossFit. There's also this, I think, a misunderstanding of what CrossFit is because I, when CrossFit was like the wild, wild west, which it certainly was back in the day because CrossFit has been around for a while now. Down here in Miami, it probably started getting big like in so I know Mike and Gio. So Mike and Gio, they're the owners of uh, Cross the Coconut Grove. And funny enough, Gio, she was actually, uh, her name is Gio Konda. She was actually my, my track high school coach. Ah, uh, cool. When I was like in 10th grade and full circle 20 years later. Um, and so her and Mike are owners of CrossFit Coconut Grove down here. And I want to say, I know Mike started getting involved with it down here like, maybe 2008 and maybe it was them together, Mike and Gio. So in 2008 was when it started getting pretty big down here and it kind of blew up from there. Um, it was the wild, wild West back then. That's without a doubt now. And I think I've never seen an industry or, or I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for. A sport, a, a sport perhaps, or even just a way of fitness and exercising. I think I've never seen anything catch up to, to maybe science and those sorts of things as fast as something like CrossFit has because CrossFit went from the wild wild west to now people are actually interested in learning about certain scientific strategies and yeah. for example JD he's the, he does a programming in our gym JD will program a strength portion so just last week we finished our, our cycle God, I forgot how long the cycle was it could have been 6 to 12 weeks I forget how long he had programmed it for but we'll do a strength portion in the beginning of the workout. It's an hour long class. So this week we're going to be doing one rep max testing. Cool. So today is going to be back squat. Tomorrow might be like power community. So there is that like, maybe he'll program like a five by five approach. Um, maybe he'll do like a five, four, three, two, one kind of approach where your first set and we're going to say, we try to do things very like time structured. So you're going to go every two minutes, every two minutes on the first set, you're going to knock out five reps at 75% of your one rep max. On the next two minutes, you're going up to 80%. You're going to do four reps. Yeah. By the end of it, you're doing 95-ish percent of your one rep max for one rep. Yeah. Right? So there are these kind of like traditional type of, of strength yeah, yeah, yeah. that we throw in there. Um, but I, I gave a presentation at ISSN Columbia this last year, and it was about nutrition for CrossFit. And a lot of it was explaining what CrossFit is. I started it. Not, not, I didn't start the whole thing, but at the beginning of my, my talk, I had a video of like gym fails. And I was like, this is what people think CrossFit is. And you have people like with like missed lifts and like someone doing a pull up at their house and like the pull up bar breaks or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like the, someone using a band to do a pull up and the band like yeah. hits them in the crotch area. Like yeah, those yeah, yeah, yeah. silly things. I mean, this is unfortunately what people think that it is. And I used to, I used to not CrossFit before, like around 2013. I used to talk all this nonsense about it. Um, but people, I think, don't realize that you can go for a 5K jog 
and that's CrossFit. CrossFit basically yeah. found an, a way to trademark exercise and fitness. <laughs> Anything can be a CrossFit workout. In fact, at the yeah. at the at ISIS of Columbia, I had everyone get up and I had them do a two minute AMRAP. So as many reps as possible of air squats in two minutes. And we had fun with it. Like I had music. It was a lot of fun. It was really cool. And then afterwards, I told people, I was like, well, for those of you that raised your hand and said that you've never done CrossFit, congratulations, you just did CrossFit, like yeah. in a sports nutrition conference. So the fact that people can get in, like you said, you get your bang for your buck yeah, because you're getting this intensity. You're getting someone who's coaching you. And like in any industry, there might be good ones and there might be not so good ones. Um, and some of the best coaches that I've seen in fitness have been CrossFit coaches. Likewise, some of the worst ones have also been CrossFit coaches. But we could say that about yeah, any yeah. industry, you know? Um, so what's fun about it, and you made the, the most excellent point of it, is the community. I think that the community aspect, the community and sport aspect, mm -hmm. because in sport, you're going to have some competition, right? Gamification. And, yep. Gamification. And that makes it fun, right? So ultimately, when it comes to anything fitness related, do whatever it is that you can possibly do and enjoy and just kind of keep on doing. The cool thing about getting someone started, because you asked about this, you asked about like, if someone is just going to get started, why would CrossFit be a good idea for them? It's because for one, you have that community aspect. So now yeah. if you have that community, people are going to be like, hey, you know, hey, my name's Eric. Oh, hey, we didn't see you yesterday. Helps with accountability. That's we exactly got it. At 1 p.m. Where, where were you, man? Where were you at, right? Yeah. And it also shows concern and care. Like, oh, hey, we noticed that you were not here yesterday. Yeah. Damn, these people like actually yep. care about me, right? Yep. And, and the whole thing of like associating with people that you want to be like. It's an immediate community of people that are doing the things you want to do. Exactly. That's exactly it, right? So it's not you, you find, uh, what's the saying? Uh, birds of uh, the same feather flock together or whatever it is. Something like Something that. Like Commonality. That. I think that's what we're looking for. <laughs> that's exactly it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm like, I'm Hispanic, bro. I don't know those days, but I could tell you like Mango and those sorts of expressions. Dude, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to say an expression when I'm talking <laughs> to somebody. I'm like, uh, just forget the expression. This is what I'm trying to say. It's happened so many times because I same thing there, bro. Like you and I didn't grow up saying these expressions like uh, all the time, you know, because we spoke Spanish at home. So it is, it is sure. that's hilarious. Well, definitely. But you know what? And for, I think most, most of the time for my entertainment, and like, like if my mom is around, she would also laugh at me. Like if I'm giving a presentation, she was at IIT in Colombia. She kind of laughed. I, uh, I'll, I'll say like, you know how in Spanish we say cada loco con su tema? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll use that in English. So I'll be like, man, every crazy person has their thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> Just, yeah. It doesn't roll off the tongue the same. No, not like, at all, not at all. I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, so if we're looking at something like CrossFit, the, and especially for a beginner, the, the scalability of everything is important. Like yeah. it, you, I don't expect someone to walk in there and be able to do a, a body weight clean and jerk, yeah. like right off the bat, they're going to have to learn these things. That's why at our gym, we'll do like a, a fundamentals onboarding or like a one Oh one to make sure that people are learning in CrossFit. There are nine uh, foundational movements. You have like the air squat, the front squat and the overhead squat. You have the shoulder press, you have the push press and a push jerk. And then you have deadlifts the sumo deadlifts high pool and a medicine ball clean. Those are like the nine foundational movements in CrossFit because all of those incorporate different movements that will be used, different movement patterns and things that will be used in pretty much all other of the other. Uh, exactly. So we kind of onboard people by doing that because we want to make sure people are getting a good introduction. And then from there, the coaches that are onboarding them and teaching them can be like telling the other coaches, hey, this person, they, they move well. You know, we might have to, be careful like with this, that, and the third movement. Um, but like they're they're good to go. Some people might need a little bit more of that coaching. So the scalability of CrossFit is great. The fact that you're getting in there for an hour, you're working on your strength, you're working on your cardiovascular fitness as well. Um, and the social aspect, like people just come in to de-stress, to be yeah. a part of the community, to talk, to hang out. Like I call it like the real happy hour kind of thing. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, so that's what makes it a lot of fun and and it, it sucks that CrossFit has gotten a lot of hate throughout the years. And I was one of those people who used to hate on it. Um, but it's so cool to see the the lives that are impacted by it now. And for me to be able to coach and educate in, the, in that realm, uh, I just absolutely love it. No, I can tell how uh, 
passionate you are about this, man. Um, it's awesome. I love seeing people who are really passionate about what they do, talking about what they do, because it, it just like comes out so naturally. Like you're just like really getting into it, talking about CrossFit. Eric, I could talk to you forever, man. We have to wrap this up. I appreciate you taking time to be here. It's always nice having a conversation with you. Could you please let people know where they could find you if they wanted to um, connect with you? And of course, I'm going to share all of your links in the description of this as well. For sure. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And thank you for having me on. It's always good chatting with you. And hopefully we could do this in person sometime soon. Maybe not record, but just hang out, get a lift in. Yeah, I man. can try to lift as much as you, which I won't be able to. And, <laughs> and I can get you to do a crossword work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they can find me. Uh, social media is just my first and last name altogether. E-R-I-K-B-U-S-T-I-L-L-O. Eric Bustillo. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. I refuse to get on there. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's pretty much those. That's uh, the best way. And if they're ever in Miami, they could always hit me up. Awesome, brother. Have a wonderful day, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.